Hello, Bull Profits Nation. Uh, welcome to Market Talk Monday on the Paul Manpilla YouTube channel. I'm Amber Lancaster. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, Paul is joining us in this video to answer questions that you've submitted to us via Twitter. And I'll then cap this Market Talk off with a good news roundup. So without further ado, hello, Paul. Great to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Amber. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, of course. Always good to see you, Paul. So actually, per your great request on Friday, you asked that I post um, a note on Twitter and solicit some good questions. All of them are great from our members and followers on Twitter and subscribers. And we got quite a few, but today we'll highlight six of them. Okay. And I'm hoping you're, you're game and... and ready to go on answering I'm, I'm always ready to go yes. at all times you know i'm i know <laughs> i'm all in all the time yes. 2 a.m 3 a.m 4 a.m 5 a.m yeah. i'm always ready to go before we get to the questions we were talking right before getting on yeah. and i had seen this tweet and i was pointing it out to you and it's from michael goodwell who's on mm -hmm. twitter who i follow and he has some great information and as you know amber i mean it's no secret I mean, the last quarter of 2021, brutal, brutal, really since, I mean, we, we went through like 2021 where it's up and down, up and down, up and down at like two times, once in May, and then sort of in September, it looked like we were gonna break out. And then the bottom fell out starting like really November and then ended in like a crash. Like for our stocks, I mean, there's nothing, other, no other way you can put it other than a crash. Mm -hmm. And um, we have told people to stay strong hands for which I've received a barrage of hate mail and hate tweets and people calling me a grifting clown and a scam artist and a fraud. That's all fine. You know, it comes with the territory and I accept it. But there was something that Michael said, and, you know, let's just put that tweet up for a second, which is that, you know, um, he says that, Liquidity has dried up in the U.S. stock market. And he has this chart which shows you that at the highs, uh, liquidity was very good. In other words, people were perfectly happy to come and buy and sell when prices were high and rising. And then as prices start to fall off, the liquidity falls off. And then as prices get very low, it completely disappears. Mm. And then he follows up a, a second tweet where, tweet where he makes a point that I think is really it's, it's an incredible, like amazing, but still simple point that we all intuitively understand, but he puts it in a way that really makes it clear. And I'll relate it as well to then like the rules of the game, which is that he writes that it's a sign of the feedback loop between high volatility and low liquidity. Mm -hmm. High volatility leads to low liquidity. High volatility, low liquidity. High volatility, low liquidity. This is the case, not once, not twice. It happens all the time, all the time. And a lot of people, their response is to want to buy and sell around this. You wrote an article and I interviewed you on my uh, Tuesday slot mm -hmm. and you ran into why this doesn't work, which is that the best days often follow the worst days. So if you're out, you didn't get the benefit. If you're out for, what was it, 30 best days, you essentially lost like, 60%, 70% of the gain. So going in and out, everyone thinks it's super easy. Yeah, it seems like, you know, in hindsight, everybody can draw a chart and a line, whatever. However, the truth is that to make big gains, you got to stay in. You have to be strong hands. You have to have that bullish, optimistic, and positive attitude. And then the other thing that I also get barraged with 8 mail for is saying, you know, rules the game, rules the game. But that tweet from Michael, Mm -hmm. The feedback loop between high volatility and low liquidity. This is the essence of like the difference between the people that are going to end up making a lot of money and the people that don't. Mm -hmm. Because what happens during periods when you have high volatility and low liquidity? Well, the people that didn't set money aside in their investment account and in the rules of the game, we say specifically leave money in your actual investment account, not in your savings account somewhere else. That may work for some people, but I think for the vast majority of people, seeing it actually in their Fidelity, Robinhood, Ameritrade, Schwab account, seeing it right there where they're like, yeah, the market's down. However, I knew that this was gonna happen at some point in time. Mm -hmm. I am prepared. 
I am ready and I have what everybody wants, which is that people want liquidity and I have it. And it puts you in this position of power. Mm -hmm. It puts you in this position of having what everybody else wants. And now you have the option that if you decide, no requirement, you can go and provide liquidity, give your cash in and take in cheap stock if you wish. No requirement that you do it, but it does give you that optionality, gives you that choice. And that is a position of power. And this is why I went and put that rule of the game in the rules of the game. Leave cash in your investment account, in your actual investment account, not in some savings account somewhere far away, not in some checking out account somewhere far away, not in some CD, you know, which would take 90 days for you to some place where you can actively feel the benefit of having that a dampen the volatility in your account. And second, put you in that position of power where you have something that the market wants and desires, which is liquidity. And you now have the option, the choice to take advantage of that. So uh, this tweet, which I, which I just saw, uh, also, you know, gets to some of like the questions that, you know, people are wondering, which is like, oh my God, there's, you know, Facebook stock, so it's just called Meta now, dropped by 25%. That's a 10 Sigma event that is not supposed to happen in human history. It's true, but in the end, it really does come back down to Michael's tweet, which is that uh, when you have high volatility, which is like, you know, so what is high volatility? When a price goes from a high point to a low point pretty quickly, that's the essence of high volatility. What happens? Well, buyers disappear, buyers disappear. Uh, and then, Everybody wants, you know, the previous high price or some high price to get out when it's unavailable. And we say, this is not an anomaly. This is not something that's chance. This is not something that, you know, you can plan around. You should plan for this. <laughs> this is the actual plan. Expect volatility. It is going to happen. And uh, it happens on some level at every time frame. There, there's, you know, there's little mini crashes on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis. Plan for it. Prepare for it. Be ready for it. And then you can go through these periods so that when you have the opposite, when you have the opposite period, which is that what do people desire? They, they desire rising prices. That is the ultimate sort of benefit that everybody wants. And we want that. However, you have to endure through the periods when the speedback loop is going against you. So now when you have high rising prices that lead to higher and higher high prices, now the liquidity comes back in. Now everybody wants in. Yeah. So, at, but however, at those prices, now if you sold out, now you got to jump back in, in all likelihood at prices that are, are rising and rising quickly, and you're on the outside looking in. So... It's been a very, very difficult few months. However, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed, folks. The promise of the fourth industrial revolution, America 2.0, still all there. Go look at the companies. Go look at their sales growth. Really, I have not seen a single one of our companies show negative sales growth. Mm -hmm. I went and looked. So PayPal, you know, its stock dropped, what, 20%? You would have thought that they went from, let's say, 20% growth to maybe now they were reporting maybe negative 20% growth. Maybe it was, you know, 30. No, they actually grew their sales 14%. 14%. And they are one of really the three big financial, you know, app purveyors, which are some mix of you know what people will look back at, you know, 15, 20 years from now as see as banks which is they control Venmo, they control PayPal. These are two large apps that have millions and millions of users that they can you know, really offer them a lot of different services. So the idea that like the stock is worth one price today and 20% lower is a function of what Michael talks about, which is that when you have high volatility, low liquidity will mean that someone is going to take a terrible price. I see zero reason. I think it would be the dumbest thing on earth for, for us to join them by saying, oh, terrible price being offered. Here, take all of my stock as well. Even if you didn't keep cash on the side, 
I would say, if you can stay strong hands through this, I can tell that our companies, they're for real. The fourth industrial revolution is for real. And I am, love it or hate it, still B-O-P, bullish, optimistic, and positive. Yeah. All right, Amber, that's really, you know, something I just wanted to say, and I'm happy now to answer, you know, any questions that, uh, that, that, that you have. Wonderful. Thank you for that intro, Paul. So we have our first set of questions are from John L. He's a follower on of yours on Twitter. Oh, yeah, I, I see John on Twitter. Hey, John. Hello, John. Thank you for writing in, John. So John's first question is regarding growth stocks and housing prices. He writes, growth stock and housing prices tend to increase with lower interest rates. If we head to negative rates in the future, both will likely move higher. Will future innovation help make housing builds, housing materials more affordable? The cost to build seems to be going up over time. Um, technology and innovation is always deflationary. Mm -hmm. the, the, there's a very common sense reasoning for this, which I have laid out, which is that what company would go and adopt an innovation that is going to make things more expensive? Uh, because if they think if they make things more expensive as a result of spending money on innovation or some technology, it makes them less competitive against somebody that is using old technology. It just does not compute. Mm -hmm. It does not compute. The other element of is that true innovation has to be significantly, significantly better than whatever existed before. Uh, in various books, I've seen the number three times, I've seen the number five times. However, in the long term, it's as much as you know, 50 times or 100 times. And it has to be that much better because when you break it down, um, for a company to adopt an innovation, they know that the benefits are going to come over time, but the cost is upfront. Mm -hmm. You got to pay money through capital spending to actually buy the thing. Then there's the extraordinary cost of implementation. Your entire organization, your company is organized around the old way of doing things. There is a severe price for disrupting all of that. You don't get the benefits of like the true promise of the innovation immediately. It comes over time as you implement it, as you optimize your company, your organization, the people who work for it around it. So the benefits come out over time. So the benefits have to be so significantly higher for you to make that decision to move. So uh, with, spe with specifically to, to, to housing, we are starting to see the first real big innovation in housing in over 100 years. There are now communities of 3D printed houses. I have seen a neighborhood in Austin that is going to be entirely full of 3D printed houses. Mm -hmm. I believe that the cost of putting up a 3D printing printed house is significantly lower once we get to scale. At this point, I believe it is, I've seen numbers as much as 15 to 20% higher than existing uh, cost because right now they are just simply not doing it in scale. And if you are using the same 3D printing machines, techniques, personnel, and you're using it again and again, now you have what is called Wright's Law. In other words, as the number of units increase, the cost plummets. And that is the shape of innovation. And for sure, in the next one, three, five years, you will see more and more and more. And uh, with that, you will uh, definitively see the cost of housing decline, which is something that would be a huge benefit to the United States, to us as a people, to us as society. So negative interest rates uh, that I have said that I believe, I mean, actually I was wrong when I made my prediction because at the time, truthfully, we already had negative interest rates. Uh, and we've had them actually for some time. However, what I was referring to is where you actively see a negative interest rate on common benchmarks like the 10-year bond, like the 30-year bond. That's really what I intended. And the, and the basis for, for negative interest rates is, is multiple fold, which is that the level of technological jump that is going to come from America 2.0, fourth industrial revolution, disruption technologies is so great that, well, uh, you are going to get first 5x more than what you used to from old industrial processes, then 10x more, then 20x more, then 100x more, and you will be flooded. 
uh, with an extraordinary amount of whatever it is that you want at a price that is so cheap hmm. that it is just will devastate the America 1.0 old world companies who having chosen to not innovate, having chosen to stick to their lane and keep to the industrial processes without artificial intelligence and internet of things and blockchain and implementing new energy or any of these things. Now, first, they're slightly behind the curve, then they're even more behind the curve. And then there's just this hockey stick moment where innovation takes off in terms of both adoption, utility and benefit. And for them, they have a hockey stick down moment. Mm. And then it's all over for them. Um, and so that's what you know is the underlying scenario that is setting up. We have massive, incredible innovation that is coming, not just one, we've got so many of these. And what we have seen when you study these innovation through history is that when they stack like this, well, it's deflationary and it's deeply deflationary. I mean, I've used the example of, you know, you if you go pre-industrial revolution, we, we work in a world of craft. If you want to make something, it's crafted one by one. And today you can make that in the hundreds of thousands, in the millions, you know, for far less than what it costs to make a one in the craft era. So that's the scale jump that is coming as a result of America 2.0 and the fourth industrial revolution, which would mean that you would need to have interest rates that really were significantly lower. And um, it does turn out that, you know, the study of interest rates, you know, negative interest rates, while recently it's an anomaly, actually we've had this for quite some time. And it is something that you can use to now sort of, you know, adjust to a deeply deflationary period. And this is a, a process of adjustment. All right, Amber, let's try another question. Yes, uh, John, second question is, my question has to do with the correlation between the labor market and innovation. There are more jobs currently than people to fill them, which contributes to inflation. Innovation leads to deflation and more automation. I'm curious how you see things playing out in the future. Well, I mean, we're in a very unusual period now where there are, I forget, an extraordinary number of open jobs. Mm -hmm. And we do not have enough people. Now, we don't know exactly where that balance will sit because we're still in a economy that has been sort of upended mm -hmm. as a result of the pandemic. So we have to see where that balance will sit. However, um, deflationary boom periods, which is what I believe is going, is unfolding. Uh, it's, it's never exactly like what, what you know, like the, the numbers never fit quarter to quarter. A deflationary boom period is 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 um, is a period when there are lots of jobs created. There are lots of jobs created. Uh, oftentimes, there's a little bit of a mismatch uh, between the jobs created and what people know how to do, which is based on the past and what they need to learn how to do to to succeed in the future. So, exactly how this will play out uh, will will. Uh, will be un somewhat unclear until it sort of happens. However, we can see the long-term direction, which is that uh, for sure, the skills that require the use of innovation and technology, technology through innovation, innovation through technology, those will be jobs that will have rising wages. And that is to be expected. That is not inflation. That is actually productivity increases because each person that is working with an America 2.0 technology, a fourth industrial revolution technology is creating far more value than someone that is using a industrial technology, spending the same amount of time, spend, spending the same amount of brain power. They're, they're, the amount that they generate in terms of productivity is now maybe comparable, but fast forward this out three years, five or 10 years is just not even going to be close. So um, the exact relationship in the short term, I'm sure people can write vast essays and you know persuade people of a lot, a lot of things. However, if you believe, if you believe, if you believe with conviction in the fourth industrial revolution, in America 2.0, in the promise of the technologies that we are invested in, then this is this is not something that you know you would say like if this is just a matter of when mm -hmm. and it's not a matter of when 25 years from now it's a matter of like each year you will start to see more and more and more of it and its impact on the labor market which will be significant mm -hmm. all right let's go next 
Sure. Uh, MB writes, silly question to you, Paul, but do you detect this week's uh, a, a, this week a small orientation into our America 2.0 growth stocks? I know it has looked like the bottom a few times already. Feels tantalizingly close. Um, right. I mean, I made a video, I think it was uh, a week ago, where I went through an extraordinary set of market events that truthfully I have never seen in my you know, time on Wall Street, which is that I have never seen in my life, even though apparently it did happen, but uh, $1.3 trillion worth of single stock options expire mm. on a options expiration day. I have never, even though I was around for the markets, I don't recall that having, you know, uh, this impact. It was somewhere near the top of the 2000 market, but $1.3 trillion in single stock options expired on, I believe it was January 22nd uh, of this year. And that overhang, I think, is a critical factor in, in sort of like determining sort of like the positioning of the market, the demand and supply balance, which is that uh, whether people think it's illegal, wrong, manipulation, the truth is, is that the market is run by the dealers, by the market makers, by people who... They've got to make money because otherwise you can't collect. There's no liquidity unless they are solvent. If all the market makers are gone, uh, you will have to go and um, and walk house to house and ask, hey, do you want my uh, uh, my Apple stock or do you want my whatever stock? They make the liquidity. Liquidity doesn't appear out of magic. It has It has been constructed over time by a series of happenstance, events, procedures, conventions, traditions that have developed around the market. And so if everybody is on one side, which truthfully, uh, that information I think was hidden. I mean, I can't prove it, but like I never saw anything really until right before expiration where I saw a piece of research published. Uh, uh, actually, somebody took a picture of it and put it on Twitter. And then there were a number of other things that also indicated that People have taken the sort of the, the base fear that was driving this, which is that the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates. And then they have taken that 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 single thing and said, well, let's go and look using basic primitive correlation, like what happens when interest rates go up. And it's based more of a story than anything else, actually based on the last story from the year 2000, really, which is that people say, well, oh, interest rates go up growth stocks crash. And then a new layer came where various people who have been bearish and wrong this entire time, people like Jeremy Grantham, it's like, this is a bubble like 2000. So we got an next, another story layer coming in, which is that this is a redo of the 2000 bubble. These stocks don't deserve to be there. And then of course they found a convenient punching bag, which is Kathy Wood and Arc Innovation. And, um, and as everyone knows, uh, Kathy Wood and I, we have identical future outlooks in terms of where the world is going. Our stocks are very, very, very similar in terms of what we are focused on. And they talk about rights law and disruption. We talk about fourth industrial revolution and America 2.0. But in essence, we, we have an identical point of view. And then, you know, then there's this uh, innov short innovation fund that comes and there's people that are looking to short. So you get like now this entire sort of like thing happen really in the space of like it all developed in the space of about three months where a lot of algorithms from macro driven hedge funds decide to make this to me dumb trade. Yeah, I know I'll get, you know, a barrage of people. Well, they made money and we lost money. All right, fine. That's fine. Send the hate at me. It's okay. But those algorithms, I think they are naive at best. And uh, let's see where they end up uh, come the end of this year. Because this notion that just because the Federal Reserve is lifting interest rates, uh, tech, tech and growth stocks need to go down, I believe is wrong. It's 100% wrong. It's 1,000% wrong. It's a million percent wrong. The second narrative that has that hit, which is that we're going through a redo of the 2000 bubble, also wrong. 100% wrong, 1,000% wrong, million percent wrong, because these people clearly are out of touch. They are not looking at these companies, not looking at the sales, not looking at what the capabilities of their technologies and the products and service that they've generated. So, and 
using Kathy Wood's performance for 2021 um, and saying, well, that shows you this is all fake. Well, folks, let's just give it a bit of time. All right. Let's just give it a bit of time. All right. And let's give our stocks and, you know, what we're investing a little bit of time. All right. And then let's see who gets to thump their chest. All right. Because I'm willing to bet I would stake my life on it that the folks that get to thump their chest last get to thump it the most and loudest. And we shall see. We're, we're down, but we ain't out. We are down, but we ain't out. And we're, we're going to have a great reversal, a great reversal. And people's like, oh, in hindsight, it was all so obvious. It was all so obvious. All right, Amber, let's yeah. go now take another question. Sure. Cool W, another great Twitter follower of ours. Hello, cool. Uh, writes, uh, how should a beginner stock investor start? with a minimum of 100 to $1,000. Um, number one, trending stock. Number two, blue chips. Three, tech. Four, ETFs uh, with managing fees below $1 or long-term call options that's attainable at the time or dividend stocks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this this question's misdirected to me since you know our focus is exclusively on America 2.0, fourth industrial revolution, disruption stocks. I mean, um, all of the things that are cited are some mix of highly speculative, highly safe, and my guess is without being specific in any way, and also noting to people that we are not financial advisors. This is the kind of thing that you would go to a financial advisor for, at least like think about from a perspective of financial advisor, and you would have to look at your risk level, your income level, what are your timeframes, uh, how much loss are you willing to withstand, uh, anything with options, you can lose all of your money. Uh, I mean, it does have the benefit of limiting how much money you can lose, but you can lose all of your money. And uh, there's things like dividend stocks where, you know, today that's, 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 a, that's a shark pool. I mean, I would not go near a lot of dividend stocks. I mean, you know, you can go look at the price action on stocks like Clorox, for example, last week. Theoretically, this is a safe stock. However, you go do some balance sheet analysis, and a lot of debt, they don't generate enough free cash flow for the amount of stock they're buying back, for the amount of dividends they're paying. This is a company that is in deep, deep, deep trouble. And there's a lot of loved, I'd say beloved, so-called blue chip dividend stocks that in the next one to three years, I think you are going to see them be in very, very, very deep trouble. And many people who have sat in them and relied on them for their dividends, really see the downside of, of using it. So I'll just say that. All right, Amber, let's go to the next one. Sure, next question's from AJ. AJ writes, hi, Amber, this question is either for Bold Profits or Profits Unlimited, your monthly newsletter, Paul. But he writes, does Paul invest in the stocks he recommends, unlike Ian with his crypto? And could Paul explain more about the electric vehicle vertical takeoff thing, the EVTOLs? Um, thanks for everything you do, Paul and Amber. I love when you talk about new things in our companies and then what they've been doing during the holding period. All right, so the, the first question, and just make sure to track me back if I skip out on answering the question. So I am not allowed to um, invest in the stocks that I recommend. However, I do own similar stocks, and I can tell you that my portfolio, just like yours, has been smashed, mm -hmm. smashed to pieces. If you think very carefully uh, about, for example, PayPal, and you think, what's the other company like PayPal? Well, why isn't that in the portfolio? Well, it's because Paul owns it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I can't recommend it. Why does Paul own it instead of recommending it to us? And has it done better than PayPal? Actually, it's done worse than PayPal over the, the time frame that, that we're in. So I didn't like somehow like secretly conspire to keep the better performing stocks. Uh, uh, and in general, I am forced to put all of my money into a tiny, tiny number of stocks. But I can tell you, if you went and looked at my portfolio, um, I've got a lot of small caps. I've got some micro caps. And I've got all growth. I do not own any dividend stocks. Let's put it out there. I do not own any dividend stocks. I do not own a single America 1.0 stock. Uh, I absolutely believe in what I'm saying and what I'm doing. I may not know the might not own the exact same stocks as you, but I have the same exposure as you. And certainly I can tell you in 2021, I have had the same performance results as you. Um, I want to offer quickly, Amber, a reasoning as to why we do this. 
And we recently had our lawyers at uh, our corporate companies called Agora mm -hmm. uh, lay out why they enforce this restriction. So apparently if a, uh, a guru, as I'm referred to, uh, owns a stock, and you do something different than what you recommend to the readers, the Securities and Exchange Commission is very interested. Uh, they want to know, well, why did you buy it for yourself and ask readers to sell it? Why did you ask readers to sell it and continue to hold it? There are all of these permutations that come about as a result of owning stocks that are also recommended. And I have seen all the research about skin in the game, et cetera. However, I would say in the end, go look at our results. We are still outperforming the market by a large amount. And I have accepted and reconciled that if I wanted to invest in our stocks, I need to go find something else to do. Mm -hmm. And if this is my, this is a burning issue for me, I need to quit and I need to move on. And I've told my publisher that. I have kept a few stocks. These are stocks that I have sort of cut my teeth on. And by that, I mean that where I've lost a lot of money by buying and selling them, doing all the right things, understanding how to invest in growth and innovation, those stocks where I have lost in many cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, I have kept those for myself and I'm invested in those. And then I have my entire portfolio essentially is about eight or 10 stocks. I mean, you know, that's all I can really keep and keep and do this job with a level of integrity um, and diligence uh, to serve you in the best way that I can. So uh, that provides a, a long answer. And now the EV toll, I mean, effectively, you've, you've done a lot of research on EV tolls. I mean, is it an exaggeration to say that these are sort of like really big drones? <laughs> they are. That's right? Right. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and uh, their range continues to increase over time. I believe that the, the most advanced one is a company that is in the Paul Secret Portfolio Service uh, publication. They have not quite, I think they, they're fairly, they're the furthest along in having their aircraft certified. And remember, folks, I mean, this is a very regulated part of, of our world. I mean, you cannot just take an aircraft up and, you know, try and see, it's like, let's guess how long it's going to stay in the air. Let's guess how much it can carry. Let's guess when it runs out of battery. Let's guess, you know, no, I mean, these, these things are certified in minute detail. Each part has to be certified. When you take it up, it's first to this level and this level. So by the time these appear, I mean, these, these are going to be as, as safe as any airplane that we all get on and off without even thinking about it. And at one point in time, you know, airplanes went through, you know, this arc of development. So in my conception of what eVTOL does is that it wipes out um, the vast majority of short short haul airlines. Why, why would you get on a plane? You know, you got to drive to some airport that takes you an hour. You go through security that takes you another hour and you sit there waiting for the plane. That's another hour. It's delayed all the time. Instead, you have city centers where you can just walk in and go get a drone. Right now it's about 150 miles. So you might need to take, you might need to do it like Pony Express style, go from one to the other. But over time, these will be slightly longer. It would also uh, wipe out um, a number of transportation, uh, really options that, that exist today that people will just be like, well, it's a lot easier to just get on eVTO. Uh, you know, I mean, Amtrak is unlikely to, to make it in this world. Um, bus companies are unlikely to make it. And um, if you combine EV tolls with robo taxis, which I believe are going to emerge in about the same time frame, now you have these choices where EV tolls give you convenience, they give you speed, they give you access. Uh, robo taxis give you cheapness and they give you free time. You can just don't have to drive. I believe the world of transportation is going to be upended. Nobody looking back 20 years from now is going to recognize a whole lot of what we have. It's going to look old and ancient. So, I mean, uh, the, the technology itself is just really builds on drone technology. Uh, and it's just scaled up so as to carry humans, to carry cargo. And that's, that's the arc of where, where we're going. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful answer, Paul. Thank you for that. And our last question that was submitted that we can reference today is from HB from South Carolina. HB writes, thanks, Amber and Paul. Here's my question. In current markets, um, how, to, how do you measure quality growth companies? Uh, we can't use a PE. If it's forward PS ratio, is that what it is? What should the ratio be? Or are there any other indicators? Uh, thanks as always, and, and HB also as don't be worried about people trolling you both. You both are great. I'm a long time subscriber to Profits Unlimited and learning a lot from your videos. Market is tough, but I am hashtag BOP for the future. Well, we are deeply appreciative for you. And as we like to say, without you, we would have no mission and purpose. And our mission is to try and serve you as best as we can. We will never make everybody happy and we will never get everything right, but we can try to do the right thing by you. Now, with respect to your question, yeah, I mean, uh, growth, growth stocks are always determined by what is growing and that is sales. I mean, I have always said, which is that even among earnings companies, companies that generate positive earnings, there is so much fudge factor after you get past sales. Which is like, you know, I mean, like, look at all the terms that ex exist EBIT, EBITDA. Uh, then there's adjusted cash flow. There's, you know, there's adjusted free cash flow. I mean, there's all kinds of like variants. So for growth stocks, we know what matters it's sales growth. Sales growth tells you if your, your technology, is something that is scaling. If your product or service is being accepted by the market, is being adopted by the market, no sales, no growth. That's really as simple as that. No sales, you have no business. Uh, and if you cannot turn that around sooner rather than later, it means that the market's not ready for you. Your, your, your technology is not mature enough to scale. Your product and service is undesired, is undesired by the market. Maybe you can get a quarter, you can get two quarters, so sales growth is what matters. And the way that we look at most things is price to sales. There's no hard and fast number. It does depend on where the company is sort of in its life. Um, for example, we've seen companies like Shopify trade at 30 times sales for years, years and years. Um, other growth companies will tend to have a sort of rising sales growth. These are driven by assumptions uh, made by investors as to the sustainability of that growth the duration of that growth, how much variability there is because of the kind of business that they're in. So there's no hard and fast number. However, one thing I can tell you is that if you go and look at the numbers today, they are cheap. They are cheap. They didn't just go across the board in our portfolio. Price to sales ratios, three, four, five. Those are cheap in any world for any type of business. They are cheap, 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 cheap. Cheap. <laughs> okay, have I said cheap enough? I mean, these are cheap. And, you know, and then when you compare it to these slow growth companies, they are trading for 14 times sales. They have no growth, none. They have, you know, the regu their regular growth rate once they, you know, the anniversary, their, their pandemic low comparisons, they're going to go back to at best single digit sales. Many of them will show active declines. So our stocks are cheap. And I believe they're setting up for a big, big, massive reversal. Good answer, Paul. I'm, I'm with you on that one. So that's it for the questions, Paul. Thank you so much for taking time to answer them. I appreciate it. Well, thanks to all the readers for sending in the questions and thanks for having me on. I know I've gone long. However, hopefully readers found it useful. Oh, of course. I know I did. Thank you again, Paul, for joining us. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome. Thanks again to Paul for joining us on this edition of Market Talk Monday. So before I sign off, uh, please check out these three good news headlines in 3D printing, robotics, and 2022's IT spin forecasts to start your week. So number one, uh, Paul posted this 3D printing good news item in our team Slack channel. And according to protocol, buying local from 3D printed robots is on the rise. Uh, the United Kingdom's Okada Group, a technology-led global software and robotics platform business that actually helps uh, US grocery chain chains like Kroger get online food orders to customers, is aiming to incorporate more AI, artificial intelligence, and robotics into order fulfillment with the use of 3D printing technology. So protocol reports, quote, 3D printers will even help build the robots 
robot parts. Uh, robots featuring 3D printed components will pick products inside existing local distribution centers that incorporate Okada's proprietary packaging grid system. Um, known as the Series 600, as seen in this picture, uh, the new bot will feature around 300 3D printed parts, resulting in a significantly reduced overall weight, uh, cheaper build, running costs, and better serviceability. Uh, the robots and updated fulfillment process will reduce labor costs by as much as 40% in the long term and remove some of the most physically demanding jobs, according to Akata CEO, uh, Tim Steiner, end quote. So that's really a, a promising news on the 3D printing uh, realm. Uh, good news number two, on the robotics front, Pizza Hut has launched a fully robotic restaurant in a box. As reported by The Spoon, uh, last month, Pizza Hut debuted a fully automated robot powered restaurant. Uh, the restaurant in a box is based on technology from Hyper Robotics, which is a food robotics startup that makes containerized restaurants. Uh, the restaurant is, quote, fully self-contained, doing everything from dropping toppings to baking and boxing. But the only thing it doesn't do is make the dough. Uh, but according to Hyper, its pizza restaurant can hold up to 240 types of dough in different sizes. And the customer initiates an order for a pizza directly from a touchscreen kiosk on a restaurant exterior or through the Pizza Hut app on a smartphone. So after the pizza is made and boxed, a Pizza Hut employee takes the pizza from a dis dispensing tray and hands it to the customer. But in the future, future versions, uh, the restaurant will be able to dispense the pizza directly to the customer, end quote. Amazing tech there. And finally, good news number three. A Gartner's IT spend forecast for 2022 shows that CIO's chief information officers are ready to take risks. Uh, last month, Gartner unveiled its information technology or IT spend forecast for 2022 per VentureBeat, uh, despite executives struggling to combat supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic, Gartner predicts that 2022 will see a quote, noticeable upswing in global IT spending. The total amount is expected to reach $4.5 trillion by the end of 2022, a 5.1% increase from last year's figures. Uh, technology such as digital twins, IoT, platforms, virtual assistants, and data fabric are expected to receive considerable funding and attention in the coming years as more and more industries and IT departments aggressively pursue hyper automation like robotic process automation, also known as RPA, to optimize digit digitization at the task-based level. So in all, CIOs are likely hoping to reduce or outright prevent the amount of manual effort required by pre-existing employees, end quote. Uh, this is also fantastic news, especially for RPA, AI, and, and IoT-focused companies. So I must add that these type of future-forward companies are recommended by Paul in his True Momentum Stock Research Service. Uh, True Momentum combines Paul's 25-plus year stock trading experience and his strategy that on average 24 stocks display true momentum every year so that means there are 24 opportunities to capture gains of 100 percent or more from pure simple stocks so true momentum investing is all about simple moves at the right time and as of the latest of our latest uh, return reporting submitted today uh, true momentum's annualized return is about 32 percent and since inception february of 2017 true momentum subscribers who have followed all of paul's true momentum stock picks well they have seen total returns of as much as 300 percent so to learn more about paul's true momentum stock recommendation service please click the strong hands icon right here over my shoulder to get all those details so that concludes this week's market talk i thank you so much for tuning in and, and staying with us we appreciate you so much and wish you a wonderful healthy safe week ahead and until next time take care